policy coherence, of course, is all about trying to get consistency, synergies across our policies and avoiding, of course, that our policies run against one another. But there are many different ways in which this term is used and several different aspects that might interest us. So this little table here is just a reminder of the kinds of things we might be interested in and the way that terms are used. So to start here, the first of these terms, and probably the best known way of talking about policy coherence, is the coherence between the aid policies of the donors, the development partners, and their other policies which they have for non-aid purposes, such as their trade policies, security, migration, you name it. And that is the policy coherence that is very often known as capital P, capital C, capital D. Sometimes it's called the whole of government approach. But there are other things that are to do with policy consistency. There's the internal consistency uh, within aid programs of donors. And I suppose a major interest there in coherence is between those bits which are humanitarian relief and those efforts which are uh, broadly called development. Then, of course, there is the consistency across the aid programs of the different development partners of the different donors. And that is the area of coherence that is dealt with by the principle of harmonization out of the Paris Principles for Aid Effectiveness. Then there is the coherence between what donor aid is doing and the policies of the developing countries uh, who we're partnering with. And that is the scope for alignment, alignment of donor with national policies. Again, it's another of the key parts of the Paris Principles. And finally, on this particular slide, there is coherence across the different national policies, coordination or whole of government approach, but at the level of the developing country. Now, the different dimensions here are shaded in different colors, and it's those that are in the oranges and brown colors, those are the ones that this study has been looking at. And in case anybody says, well, what about number one? Number one was deliberately set aside here because that is an area of aid policy. It's an area of development policy, which is reasonably well understood and which, for which certain aid donors, and in particular the European Commission, take extremely seriously in their procedures these days. So we said no need to, to, to look at that. We know enough about that. Let's look at these other aspects of policy coherence. So the study that we carried out was aiming to do the following. The overall element that we were looking at was tracing the consistency between the way in which agricultural and rural development policies and the Paris Declaration and the Accra Agenda for Action, what, how, how consistent those were. And specifically, we set ourselves the following questions. Is there a problem with coherence? And in particular, is agriculture, is, that, is rural development a little more difficult to achieve coherence than for other sectors, such as health, education. And if there are problems with incoherence for our sector, uh, what are the causes of that incoherence? And last of the specific questions, what of the global initiatives, and particularly the wave of global initiatives since 2007 that deal with matters of agricultural production, food and nutrition security, and all of those global initiatives, which with every year become more important for adaptation and mitigation of climate change. And then, of course, the final and obvious question is that having reviewed the field, what is it we should be doing to improve practice? So that's what we were aiming to do. Now, here are the activities that were carried out. And the literature has been reviewed uh, across quite a few quite a wide range of aspects, including um, a bit of work on political economy of, of policymaking. Uh, interviews were carried out with 
fairly senior staff at the headquarters of seven leading development agencies. And those seven were the World Bank, uh, USAID, uh, DFID, um, the Netherlands, the European uh, Commission, uh, FAO, IFA. I hope that makes sense. Um, we did a review of the views of northern NGOs and why, why look at the positions of some of the northern NGOs. That is because the northern NGOs have been civil society leaders in drawing attention to issues of policy coherence. We looked at the way that global themes were being developed and implemented as, as practical propositions. Uh, in order to address this question of did they make the job of getting more coherent policy more or less different. We looked at the way that development agencies themselves carry out policy performance assessment, try to measure themselves and try to internally make their actions as coherent as possible. And last but not least, we took four country cases Cambodia, Honduras, Mali, and Mozambique. And in those countries, we tried to look at aspects of coherence by selecting four different policies or programs, two that were, regard, that were, that were regarded locally as more or less successful, two that were less successful or outright problematical, and review those as case studies to look at the extent to which matters of consistency, coherence, coordination were issues that affected outcomes, yes or no, and if so, how. So those are all the things that we did. So without any further uh, preliminaries to this, what are the main findings that come out? Well, four key points can probably be made arising from the study that we did. And the first one looks at the Paris, the principles that came from the Paris Declaration. And that says the following thing. There has, of course, been an awful lot of activity since 2005 to improve harmonization amongst donors. And there are plenty of people whose, whose opinions are that that is being improved. Now, when you come down to the country level, we found that the 16 different programs and policies we were looking at, in almost all the cases, you could check the box that says, yes, these are aligned with national policy. Formally, they were. But the problem was that was only the case because national strategies in all four cases were way too permissive. They didn't make many hard choices, they did not set priorities, and therefore almost anything sensible that had been um, funded, planned, and carried out with donor support was always going to be aligned with some part of the overly flexible national policy framework that was in place. And the consequence of that was that donors were therefore doing additional analyses, and many countries, of course, within agricultural and rural development, you have a dozen different external uh, development partners, and each one of those is running their own diagnosis of the agricultural and rural development sector, often coming to slightly different conclusions about what the priorities are, and effectively, by so doing, we're doing much of the job of actually defining and setting policy inside of these very permissive national policy frameworks. So alignment, yes, but ownership, which of course is probably the single most important principle arising from Paris, and you, you were looking at this and saying, how much ownership is there there? And when we continued looking at dimensions of, of of um, agreement with the Paris principles. Alignment with national systems, boy, there was a lot to be done there. An awful lot of the programs we were looking at, they had their own implementation units, they had their own budget systems, accounts that were off 
the national systems, their own monitoring systems, and so on. Uh, the irony, of course, was that on several of the programs that we were examining, local people were telling us, um, actually, it works, it works a bit better when there's a donor implementation unit than when it's done through the formal national system. And indeed, <coughs> excuse me, indeed, in some cases, the implementation unit, which the donors insisted on, is a more transparent vehicle than had we done it through the regular ministry or the regular agency that should have been doing the job. So there we are, a sort of picture that says formally we're making progress on the Paris Principles, but the spirit of the Paris Principles, you would look at this and you'd say, my goodness, we're quite a long way from the spirit of this. And there was in general from our informants, or we interpret from our, our informants, a skepticism about formally pressing ahead with trying to make the Paris principles stick in a formal sense. That is, not, that is not against the spirit of them, but the mechanical application of them uh, didn't look like a place to go forward. So really, once you say that national ownership is a problem, we then transfer ourselves from the issue of coherence, and we're then asking ourselves, well, why on earth would a government, why would a developing country government not want to set out a firm, clear set of priorities for agriculture and rural development? And we think the answer to this lies in two features of our sector. Now, the first feature of agriculture and rural development is it can be difficult, or it can be awkward, it can be tricky. And what makes it tricky is both what is recommended as the means of getting things done, but also the ends, the actual objectives, are often contested. Now look, where, where do we get to that particular judgment? Well, agriculture, of course, is a private endeavor for the most part, carried out by family enterprises, household enterprises that are very often small farms. Agriculture is carried out over very large areas, and often large areas with poor access physically in communications to the cities, to the ports, to the national centers of the countries involved. And that gives us um, three features of agricultural and rural development that don't make life easy. Now, the first one is that when you've got a sector which is carried out over a very large regional, area, regional areas, which is intimately involved with the natural ecology, the technical certainty over what you should be doing in any given area to address any given problem is not that, is not that certain. There are always going to be technical uncertainties. Just because a particular rice seed has worked in Bangladesh in a particular flooded paddy field um, ecology doesn't mean that this seed is any use in upland Sierra Leone. To state the blindingly obvious, but that applies to just about everything we do with agriculture and rural development. Moreover, whilst some parts of what we try to do on agriculture and rural development are fairly straightforward, we do run into some quite difficult problems, such as what do we do about rural financial markets? Across the developing world, rural financial markets routinely do not work well. Very few small farmers in the world get access to formal credit. We know that. It's been a problem now for 40 or 50 years. This is down to the fact that rural market failures are quite severe in finance. And we know that government replacing both the rural financial markets has a very poor record. That just brings in a whole set of other problems. So how do we deal with that? Um, there are solutions in some cases. We have found some working ways. Uh, obviously, things like the Grameen Bank in this case work in particular cases. But in other cases, there is a degree of technical uncertainty. There is also a very wide set of objectives which apply to agriculture and rural development. Why do we run into a wide set of objectives? We have a sector which typically makes up the livelihoods of 60, 70, 80% of low-income countries. 
it also physically occupies 70 or 80 percent of the national territory. It is often the biggest generator of exports. It usually generates 20, 30 percent of GDP. So agriculture and rural development is usually expected to contribute to national economic growth, to make major contributions to poverty reduction, to be the prime sector that addresses issues of food and nutrition security. It is a major focus for preventing environmental degradation, for dealing with the entire ecological problems that many countries deal with. And it is the sector which is trying to deliver equity, fairness, both regionally, by gender, and by social group. Now, that is a very wide set of objectives that apply to agriculture and rural development. And I will always argue that if we were working, for example, on the energy sector, or you know, providing electricity or something like that, we would not be expected to solve all of those problems at the same time. In agriculture and rural development, we often see national plans for ARD that have objectives across all of those seven or eight different uh, dimensions there. Now, the second thing that makes our, our sector a little bit difficult for, for others is we have messy things in the, in the political economy. So politically, we know that governments have to answer to many diverse constituencies. And by and large, in many countries, urban interests trump rural interests, partly because the rural poor are very rarely well organized. And we know that short-term matters tend to tend to uh, trump longer-term issues. So short-term interest, for example, in keeping down the price of bread will trump longer-term issues of providing price incentives to, and livelihoods to farmers. Institutionally, we know that the agriculture and rural development mandate is in most countries split across several agencies, different ministries, and so on which means that we get fragmented policy making for our sector, and it means the administration itself cannot create an effective lobby group, advocacy group in itself for agriculture and rural development, perhaps substituting for the lack of effectiveness of the ability of rural people themselves to organize their political voice. And finally, we have got the operational difficulties the lack of capacity to analyze policy decisions, to deliver services, to invest, to operate public infrastructure, which is there. And these are all things where development partners usually cannot supplement effectively that lack of capacity because they simply don't have that many staff in the field. I know there are exceptions amongst the development partners, but many do not have many staff in the field. And when they do have staff in field, they're there because of their professional and technical skills, and less so for the political and administrative issues, which are very often equally important in coming to some kind of feasible, acceptable policy for the sector. Now, the third point that we'd really hammer home is this is the moment you go down the political economy track, it's very easy to be seduced into a sense that nothing can ever be, de ever be changed, that the political economy traps us, uh, that it's utterly determinate. Well, not so. We shouldn't overstate the difficulties. Because the moment you run an exercise like this, we find that there are successes out there. And when we look at our successful programs, and you know, we deliberately went looking for a couple of successes in four different countries. It's usually where stakeholders have formed together interest groups determined to see the policy or program through. And just, uh, you know, a few quick examples of what we're talking about there. Uh, from Mali, we have the 30-year experience now of reforming serious markets. In the same country, we have the reform of the uh, of Piste de Niger, a big irrigation scheme for growing rice and other crops um, alongside the, using the water from the, the Niger River. In Mozambique, for example, we have uh, the actions taken for conservation in the Gorongosa 
National Park, and we have the National Forum, which has been constituted to push forward the cashew nut industry. In Honduras, we have cases of people coming together to link successfully smallholders to bigger players in the supply chains and end users for added value and better return for small parts. So we do have these successes. Now, what do we know about these particular successes? There are a few things that make a difference when we get success in these cases. So here they are. In almost all cases, there is a clear and substantial issue on which the coalition, the interest group, has been formed. And it has to be a substantial, tangible issue on which there is a consensus on the key points. Now, the next point follows on from this, because you might say, well, how on earth do you get consensus? Because you've already told us that agriculture is a tricky old, a tricky old area. Well, it's usually because we're dealing with something where there is either a very real sense of crisis. So how do you get a cereals reform in Mali? Well, you find yourself in the, in the late 1970s with a cereal sector, which is costing the government a lot of money. It isn't producing the growth of cereals. It isn't keeping down prices. Uh, the thing is a mess, and people recognize that there is a critical point at which action simply has to take place. The other point, of course, is a promise. The Afis de Niger was both a crisis and a promise, a wonderful irrigation scheme, technically a great bit of infrastructure, not producing the rice, not producing the, the agricultural output that it could, and it was an open goal waiting to be scored if only you could sort out the management of the irrigation scheme. So a crisis and a promise can help focus attention on things. Another principle in there, in the formation of these coalitions, don't try and get everybody inside of the tent. Just work with those people who've got a real, real stake in what's going on. And the, the simple point here is negotiating across a range of stakeholders is a difficult enough business at the best of times without including people who haven't got a major stake in what's going on. Then uh, one of the elements is there is sustained interest and effort where you've got a continuity of aims, purpose, and resources. That doesn't mean that we lock everything in stone, but it does mean that we have the various partners committed to making a difference in something other than the short term. These are all efforts which have gone on for five, ten, and in the case of the Malian uh, serial reform, we're probably into about three decades, which is great. I mean, that's absolutely wonderful. But you might then say, well, where do we get that sustained uh, effort? We get it from leadership. We get it from visible, tangible progress in the short term. So getting a few short-term wins in there where people can be encouraged that their coalition is making a difference is awfully important to sustaining the effort in the long term. And there's a final little comment down there that external circumstances, of course, uh, are, are an uncontrollable variable in this. Sometimes they can help. So in the case of Mali, both the efforts in Mali benefited from the major devaluation of the Franc Cifar in, when was it, 1993, 1994, thereabouts, that, that gave a big boost to domestic production of cereals. Uh, but then sometimes, of course, external circumstances uh, can sink the ship. Um, okay. Fourth finding that we, we've got, fourth and last of our findings, the global initiatives. Do all the efforts for food and security, nutrition, does climate change, do they, do they distract from getting a clear, coherent focus on what we're doing? And my judgment from the interviews we were hold, holding that was that they probably didn't. Um, they were helping to focus, they were actually helping to galvanize uh, action. And that shouldn't surprise because on the last, on the last slide, taking the country cases, um, a crisis, an opportunity, something that focuses is a really good way to get coalitions uh, of, of interest pointing in the same direction. Which is not to say that there aren't uh, dangers with this, um, 
agricultural development scene as we must improve production and, and nothing else is, is clearly a danger. So those were all of our findings. Implications, a few implications of this. Uh, we would argue that implementing the Paris and Accra uh, agenda in a rather mechanical way as a series of planning procedures to be applied uh, probably isn't a great way to use our resources, isn't a good place to focus our efforts. And we make the following comment, that the high cost of, of, of coordination, of formal coordination, probably pays off when you're in sectors where the state is doing most things, such as health, education, roads, water, and so on. But when you're in the world of agriculture, and so much is in private hands, and the government can't actually control what's going on, and there's a very large and diverse and changeable natural and environment, economic environment, and then we probably don't want detailed, comprehensive planning here. Probably more important is what we talked about before, which is getting the political will and resources focused on specific issues where we can get agreement that leads to effective action across diverse stakeholders. So that leads us then to the point of saying the big agenda is how do we get more country leadership? And of course the answer to that is it's really easy to talk about this, far less easy to say what should we be doing here? So the two things that we're suggesting here is we really want to look at how we can get political will and resources focused on defined priorities which are keenly felt. Uh, there is a danger here, of course, which is you can get very effective coalitions forming around policies which are, are, are quite, quite questionable um, or entirely dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional policies. We know all about that within the European Union where farmers are extremely good at um, forming together for a voice for subsidies. Um, so that leads us to, uh, to our, our, our next point about country, country leadership, and that just says that in the long run, uh, there is a major job that needs to be done, which is to help build a rural civil society as an interest group that demands from its government effective delivery of goods and services that citizens of the country uh, should be entitled to, and which leaders and public agencies are made accountable to that particular interest group, to create interest groups which can act as countervailing power to any self-serving elites and any narrow coalitions that may have been formed. And that brings us to the overall point which says, well, it's processes that matter and will make a difference to those in the long haul. And so development partners that want to engage with those national processes to try and make a difference, to provide support where an outside donor can sensibly provide support, well, we're going to need more field staff and field staff who are alive to these issues and we need to commit to long-term work. Short-term efforts are unlikely to, to, to do the trick. And the final reflection here says this. If agriculture and rural development is in some ways a more difficult sector than some to work with, what do we do about those dimensions of, our, uh, uh, of trickiness, awkwardness that we deal with? What do we do about the fact that it is possible to have different values across the very right and wide range of objectives that we're trying to meet? How do we get coalitions around that? There is simply no alternative way to this until somebody tells me than bringing different stakeholders together, looking for dialogue, looking for compromises, looking for points of action around which people can say, we will take this one forward. It may be an incomplete action, but we can progress in this direction. And what do we do about debates over technical means of getting things done? Well, the answer there is we need a bit more analysis, but before anybody says this is a researcher pleading for more research, 
No, it isn't. I would say we need to learn a lot more from the experiences that we have. We have an awful lot of ARD experiences, and we need to be more thorough and more complete about evaluating our experiences. This study is a very timely one uh, in the current context, both um, within OECD and more internationally on, on development as a whole and on the broader, uh, uh, sorry, on the agricultural development issue in, uh, area in particular. There's a high concern among OECD and DAC members at the moment um, and in, in the current period to improve the coherence of development policy. Agriculture and rural development. This is evidenced in the OECD context by its own flagship publication at the ministerial last year, this year, sorry, on poli better policies for development, and also in the new OECD strategy on development uh, discussed at the ministerial council meeting in in uh, May, where there's a big um, priority put on uh, increased coherence and coordination, shall we say, between main donor in practice. And also, in the context of the preparations for the fourth high-level forum on aid effectiveness for, in Busan, which is coming soon, where there will also be a proposed shift towards uh, away from aid effectiveness towards development effectiveness and, uh, and all that that uh, means with it. And lastly, there, it's a good follow-up to the um, to the, the evaluations of the Paris Declaration, which now have gone through Phase One and Phase Two, published uh, earlier this year, where the evaluations have stayed at a very a much more general level with country case studies, uh, but not so much focus at the sectoral level. And so this study. It, it's very important in bringing out the specific issues relating to agriculture and rural development and increased coherence um, and uh, coordination. The, the evaluations of the Paris, Paris Declaration have shown um, that context is key, and I think that this uh, study, I mean this uh, PKD one, has uh, confirmed that that's very, very important and needs to be factored into any any uh, any work on. Uh, policy coherence in the sector and more broadly. And the second one that I would just focus on is that ownership by key actors is also key as a and is a continuous process. Um, and I think this comes out nicely in, in this uh, in this PKP one as well. When this study was launched in 2009-10, the platform hoped it would uh, provide practical lessons to help foster more policy coherence in agricultural and rural development. And I think that this study has provided an awful lot of evidence that's very useful based on, on case study work and on interviews with, uh, with uh, key important. The issue now for me is, okay, how do we move forward as a development and uh, development community, a donor agency community, and in partnership uh, with the key actors involved in uh, agriculture and rural development processes. In the foreword, I, I said that um, a key challenge for development partners and international agencies is to find ways to incorporate the conclusions of this uh, study into their policies and practices for agriculture and rural development, and to ensure that the objectives of agriculture and rural development, poverty reduction more broadly, food security, Etc. are not contradicted by other policies and approaches. And I wonder if we can build on this study and, and the uh, findings that were just presented as platform members to identify further examples of good practice, um, share them via the platform, and fi you find ways to discuss them in uh, platform fora and other key fora. Um, and I, I think that now it, it's important for platform members to identify and suggest ways for appropriate follow-up to, to incorporate the lessons into their own procedures and practices. Uh, I think that's a big challenge where we could talk a lot and but bring together examples of best practice again from, from the membership. So that's what I wanted to say 
right now. I, there is another issue, that, um, a broader one, which uh, Steve, you didn't talk about uh, so much in this presentation, and that's the broader issue of food security, which is, has multi is a multifaceted um, uh, area of development. And given the importance of food security programs at the national and global level, um, and the amount of resources that are being uh, put into uh, global and national operations, uh, it would be important to find ways to address policy coherence issues in that process, because I think policy coherence for development remains a big challenge for food security. You know, food security and, and nutrition are uh, perhaps some of the more complicated outcomes within our sector. And I'm chuckling because, you know, part of the, part of the presentation that I've just given has this rather uncomfortable business of trying to tell people who might be outside of our sector that our sector is difficult. Now, if any policymaker stuck me against the wall and says, stop, stop this stuff, I would say some aspects of our work is, 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 is awkward, it is tricky. Some, some, some bits are, are very straightforward indeed. And, you know, if you're feeling uh, disheartened as a policymaker, stick to those main bits which are straightforward and you will make a lot of progress. Yeah? And those main things are to do with the rural investment climate and they're to do with providing rural public goods. Now, most of that is pretty straightforward. And I would say that to any policymaker, if you get those two things right, you will see agricultural growth. You will not necessarily see food security and nutrition. So this is um, a particularly tricky area to get into. So it's almost inevitable within a world of food and security nutrition that unless we are extremely skillful, we are likely to run into problems of coherence, you know, that within the various things that make people more or less food secure, that we over-attend one dimension and under-attend another. And Kareem, you, you've just set a very, good, a very good challenge there, which is uh, if you have, you know, your, your 30 seconds uh, trapped in the lift with the permanent secretary of, 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 of the Ministry of Agriculture in, in Tanzania who said, what should we do about food security and nutrition here? What is the, what is the simple, straightforward, but not deceptive message about that? To see the platform members discuss and decide on uh, the clearer inclusion of food security in, in, in their overall discussion of that area, which until now has been more or less strictly um, restricted to agriculture and rural development. So let me close it. Let me thank Steve and let me thank Kareem and let me thank everyone else who joined. Uh, I personally enjoyed it and uh, it's br bringing more or less to a close a process which I've also thoroughly enjoyed. So thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, Bye Kareem also. Goodbye. Yeah, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. See you. Thank you.